Thank you very much, and thank you, Abdullah and Josie, for that extremely detailed and thorough um, lecture. It's crazy how much you can fit into one hour. Um, and just how you went over everything about reality and revelation, um, subhanAllah, it's crazy how clear it is. Um, and so we'll be going into our Q&A session. And so as I had said before, um, if you do have any questions, you can uh, pop them into the Q&A um, channel. Um, and so while people are sending in their questions, um, I will just go over a few uh, small little announcements. Um, and so just the first one is that we are going, we are doing um, a giveaway each day um, of the UIW lectures um, to win a free copy of Blackness and Islam by UIW, our guest speaker, Sheikh Tawad Walid, um, who will be speaking on Friday. And so there's five giveaways in total. Um, and the winners will be announced in the lectures every night. Um, and I will be popping in the link um, in the chat in just a second. Um, and we already have our first winner. I don't know if she's here, but Nabiha Ansari. Um, and so if you are present, we will be contacting you via um, Instagram. Um, and you can also um, uh, enter the giveaway on Instagram and Facebook. And I will be sending the link right now. And so you can just go ahead and put all your questions through the Q&A, inshallah. And then we will begin shortly with that session. Okay, so we do have our first question. So it's, um, how do you grapple with these ideas of uh, necessitarianism and determinism um, that you are bringing up here while also maintaining the idea of our having free will? And then to clarify, if we are following the idea of the principle of sufficient reason, i.e. that of a first cause, and the determinism that philosophers tend to consider follows from it, how are we to say that we still have free will? Okay, um, you almost said falafel there, which is which is pretty much which is um, more 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 interesting than some philosophers. I might, I'm <laughs> um, certainly these um, uh, in the postmodern era, unfortunately. Um, okay, so uh, in essence, there no one has really argued uh, convincingly against uh, the existence of free will. Well. Um, they, they it's just maybe kind of presupposition suppositions they say well everything is, is caused everything is determined and so um, humans are also then part of causality part of determinism and so their actions are part of determinism too so their actions are determined by their circumstances genetics and so on and so forth uh, whereas what we would say is that first and foremost uh, we don't have an account of um, of of, of a physical account of, of what is observing in us inside ourselves as in what is actually experiencing inside ourselves uh, they say it's you know consciousness um it, the reason being and the reason why we can deduce that they, they can't it can never there can never be a materialistic account of it is due to the um uh, homunculus regress fallacy right the homunculus which is maybe if inside yourself there's, there's a smaller thing inside yourself watching what's watching through the eyes of that smaller thing and then what's watching through the eyes of the smaller thing inside that that thing's mind and what's small what's watching from the smallest thing in that side of the thing's mind so it creates an infinite regress fallacy of um observers smaller and smaller observers like a a um mamushka doll of smaller and smaller dolls right so it's the homunculus the homunculus fallacy uh so mater materialist or let's say kind of strict metaphysical naturalism can't account for a consciousness uh, so it can't account for consciousness then what is creating this consciousness in the first place well you know the quran uh, discusses this uh, is that what's it, what is creating consciousness or what is what has made consciousness is, is the creator a uh, creator facilitates a thing to to bear witness uh, so this thing that's bearing witness inside of us uh, we it, we're not told what it is but we just told that there's basically there is some secret in, to life inside us that we um we we we, we don't know uh, we don't know what it's you know uh, what it's made out of or how it's brought about but it's brought about by the by the creator um making making things in this universe that can bear witness uh, that can be uh, conscious can experience not just react to stimuli like uh plants or like uh your, your you know the cameras and things like that right so um that's the first thing so naturalism can't account for that so then what about then free will because if this thing if you have consciousness which is in a way outside of, of the material world or can't be accounted for the material world, then surely then free will resides in the exact same, lo the exact same locus 
as this consciousness, which is outside, you know, uh, naturalism, outside the material world. Um, and so, so, so what happens? Um, so what we can see is that to give you an analogy, perhaps of the relationship between consciousness of this, whatever is inside us, that is conscious experiencing and um, how free will manifests is imagine there's a, a, a railroad track that forks up in two different directions. So it forks up in two different directions. Um, your uh, whatever is doing the, the observing inside you is it's like one that's standing on the side of this of the railroad track on the lever um going one way or going the other it can it steers it between two options only between two options now anyone uh standing at the end of that track with seeing the, the train come and go onto its track they'd say oh of course the train was going to come are gonna gonna reach this destination because it's been it, it was moving the train has no choice but to move along the track it can't go off the track so it's determined to get to that destination it was like well yes the 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 one that moves the track can't stop the train uh, and and depends on the train to be moving uh, outside its control i.e causality this is, this is the the metaphor for causality here but it doesn't mean it has no ability to uh, have some influence. And the influence isn't in making the train go forward. The train goes forward regardless. You know, life force, your life, your, your motivations, uh, your, the, the causality of this universe will impel you to do things, uh, outside, obviously, you, and you must do them. But you have a choice. When you're given a choice between two things, uh, you can then choose which one of those things to do. And this can only manifest itself when there is two options presented. But it's not often you get these two options presented, right? Most of what you do is actually just calculated. It's actually just, um, you know, uh, uh, Benjamin Libe did obviously neuroscience uh, experiments on, on free will. And he said that, you know, uh, the, the experiments have shown that while uh, only shown that most of what people call decision making is just calculation. Uh, the best optimal outcome for a particular desired goal. However, uh, the the experiments did allow and uh, the uh, scope for humans to to choose not to, to do what they were going to do, what they were intended to do. They can choose to refrain from acting. Okay, that's that's your free will. You can choose to refrain from acting. And so what we find is that um, humans have two processes in a way, a parallel process. You have your intellect and you have your heart, let's say, or your subconscious, right? Uh, so when you have a very strong desire uh, to do something and uh, your intellect alerts you that, there, that that might not be in your best interest or it goes against another desire, which might be weaker, but you know uh, that intellectually that desire is more justified, like doing the right thing. Um, uh, let's give you a real example that you students will know about when you finish your university um are you gonna how are you gonna write your 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 cvs your curriculum vitae's or what you call it resumes right how are you gonna write it many people are because they're all competing for the same jobs they will pad pad their uh, cvs their uh, resumes we call it cvs in the uk um by lying exaggerating a bit uh, their work experience what they did uh, you know make it out that they invented the cure for cancer or something uh, as as the uh, work experience working at the local drugstore <laughs> or something like that um, because it gets them some advantage. Um, how to then refrain from that? We say, well, I shouldn't lie because lying is wrong uh, because it goes against the, the very purpose of my existence, um, which is to bear witness to the truth. And, and of course, the creator is the truth. Um, it, that might not be such a strong motivation for you at the point of you writing your resume to make a job application to get you a good job and a comfortable lifestyle and for men um you know a, a good a good partner because obviously for men it, there's a there's a correlation between having um a uh, a good income and a good partner let's just say in most societies uh obeying the standard universal almost gender dynamic that occurs um so what do you do in that scenario? What do you do in that situation? The strongest motivation will be to, to lie and get that benefit. That's, that will be the strongest motivation you feel. The weaker motivation will be don't lie. It's, it's wrong uh, uh, to lie. Uh, for most people, will be will experience it like that. But the fact that you can pick a weaker motivation over a stronger motivation 
uh, is demonstration of free will. But then someone could say, ah, but, but you see, Abdullah, you picking the, the weaker motivation, um, it was still being caused, it was still determined because it was a motivation. It's like, well, it wasn't determined I would pick that over the other alternative, which was, which felt to me to be stronger, right? Felt to me to be stronger. So um, at the, in the railroad tracks example, the train is going forward and it's always gonna go forward and it's gonna go, it's gonna, it's gonna go in that in forward direction. The question, the question is, you can turn the lever, which way will it go? Will it go left or will it go right? And anywhere it ends up, you'll have, uh, you'll have a skeptic determinist saying, oh, the train was bound to be there to reach this destination because it was always going to be going to this destination because it was moving on the tracks. It couldn't go out of the tracks. But the determinist doesn't see that there was alternative tracks um, being uh, uh, existing. Right? They don't see that because you don't, you don't see what never came about, right? You don't see what never came about. So... Uh, anyway, um, what is very fascinating then from the, the Quranic explanation to reality is that uh, the Quran calls the opportunity to have your free will where you are, where you know you're given a strong desire one way, which is like bad, and a, and a, a weaker desire the other way, but you know it's the better one because it fulfills intellectually, it's justified. It calls oh, cool. this imtihan in Arabic or tests, a test is the opportunity for you as a human being to manifest your free will. And the creator gives you tests. The Quran tells us the, the creator gives you a test um, because that test allows you to demonstrate and manifest your free will. Without tests, you wouldn't have free will. You'd just be a calculator. You just calculate, you know, optimal, um, uh, the optimal uh, goal resolution, you know, optimal goal achievement. So anyway, um, I hope that gives you uh, somewhat of an answer. Um, but if you'd like, I can only I can refer you to uh, the, the free will experiments uh, by the neuroscientist uh, Benjamin Libe, uh, written L I B E T, uh, who was the. I mean, he, he wasn't just one guy doing this. Uh, he was the guy who started doing the experiments on free will. Like he was, in a way, the guy who was the founder of free will experiments in neuroscience. Um, and, and he's not dead now. This is like only recent. So it's actually very recent. These experiments are done, um, and he demonstrated that uh, there there is scope for human beings to uh, be able to refrain from an action that they want to do, so they can choose to do otherwise than the action that they are being impelled to do by the strongest motivational forces. And of course, um, I can go into details about the experiments and about um, how that they they diff they. Um, they choose uh, how, how they, they kind of distinguish between um, uh, where a choice is made before the person experiences the, the feeling of a choice of a choice being made, which reaches really the calculation. Um, but also the fact that uh, Benjamin Libay's experiment even proved the Quran, the, the Islamic explanation of reality even further, because in the in the there's a hadith, um, uh, so narration by the Prophet Muhammad, uh, sallam, sallam, which said that uh, God forgives you. For the whisperings of your heart, if, if the heart, if your heart gives you a whispering, um, tells you to do something which is bad, and you choose, choose, uh, obviously you, you don't do it, uh, you're forgiven for it. Like you're not, you're not accounted for your desires because you don't have a control over your desires. Right? You don't control your desires. Um, your your desires just pop out due to your your, uh, let's say, subconscious recognizing opportunities to fulfill various instinctual motivations. So you can choose to basically say no to your desires, uh, but it also indicates that your desires are, are not your choice, uh, which is quite so. So Benjamin Libe's experiments only further demonstrate the Islamic explanation of reality is, is true and accurate and amazingly so. So I hope that answers your question, but feel free to obviously to kind of uh, make subsequent points uh, or make raise a raise a subsequent contention if you'd like. Thank you for that response. Um, so we do have another question. Um, I just just want to make a quick announcement. It is Maghrib time in um, British Columbia, and so um, if you did need to go pray, you can do that, and then you can join back for the remaining um, Q and A session. And for those, if you are heading out, I did just want to quickly announce um, a quick overview of our Tuesday events, and so. Um, 
Tomorrow we're starting bright and early um, in BC at 9 a.m. PST with our virtual booths again. And so we have an Islamic trivia and then our general Dawa booths. And then we also do actually have a live asking it anything with um, Abdullah and Delusi, our speaker here. Um, and then we also have more um, sessions of stories and reflections and then um, ask a Muslim anything. And then at 4 p.m. PST, we'll continue with our next um, uh, lex lecture uh, by Sheikh Mohammed Yafa titled Islamophobia Unchecked. Um, and so I will continue on with the questions now. So the next question um, is, if we, are, if we are to entertain global skepticism, why are we limiting the discussion only to our senses and not extending it to logic and mathematical reasoning? Also, does a change not occur in God when he brings the first cause into motion? Okay, so if we are to entertain global skepticism, um, why are we limiting the discussion only to our senses and not in, uh, extending it to logic and mathematical reasoning? Um, well, well, uh, if you're arguing that um, we can basically, uh, we, we are basically, you know, refuting skepticism, why don't we, we kind of bring it into we're discussing mathematics? So, now, uh, logic, people get confused as to what logic means. So it, it appears to many people as a vague um, or ambiguous term. So let's kind of um, bring it down to earth. Um, logic is based on the principle of non-contradiction. Non non That's it. So simply replace the word logic with non-contradiction, the law or the law of non-contradiction, if you'd like, because all the principles of logic can be derived by from and are, are derived from the law of non-contradiction. Um, but logic is more of a like a formalized way of putting sentences and writing sentences down uh, to check for non-contradictions and uh, to check for non sequiturs and and so on and so forth. Um, and, and mathematics is just the law of non-contradiction applied to quantities. Um, uh, so it's a counting rule and added to that the law of non-contradiction applying to quantities. Uh, so in essence, both of those boil down to the law of non-contradiction. And when I, and I was able to refute skepticism uh, or, or a type of, sorry, say, type of, of uh, epistemological nihilism, by recourse to the law of non-contradiction, in that uh, the creative universe couldn't intend you to have senses on, on observation of this universe and experience of it and knowledge of it and uh, the thinking capacities, and then give give humans no way, sh shape, or form uh, any ability to even to, to have any type of uh, models of the universe they could build that that has any resemblance to to it as a, as a reality. It would be a contradiction. Uh, in God's intent, He makes a universe that, can't, that is unintelligible, but makes us intelligent. Um, it would be a contradiction in, uh, in terms, basically. So um, that's why I would I would basically uh, say that. Now, the the other point you may raise was a good point. Just uh, does does a change not occur in God when He brings the first cause into motion? Uh, well, what what do you mean by change, right? So your your thinking again of finite things, uh, a finite thing. When it move, when it when it does something, it moves, doesn't it? It has to move, and of course, and of course, because of a composite of different substances or materials, there's a there's an alteration of its configuration. It changes in its configuration in order to move something outside itself or to, to affect something outside itself generally. Uh, but if the creator is not made of anything, it doesn't have a shape or form, what changes in the creator when it basically initiates uh, the universe? Uh, so change occurs, but not in the creator. It occurs in the fact that there was nothing and then there was something. So there was nothing and then there was the universe, right? That's the, that's the change that occurs, but it's not in the creator. And uh, the, you know, we don't need to argue for, um, we don't say that there was an infinite series of uh, a causal chain of changes going back into the past, because obviously that, because it is an infinite regress fallacy. All we say is that God is the first initiator of change. And that's it. Uh, and there's no contradictions in, in that um, uh, assertion and inference. Hope that makes sense. If you think anything I say doesn't make sense or you want further elaboration, just uh, raise it again or, or make a, a more detailed elaboration of your question or contention. Um, but as I said, please, you know, obviously please do um, challenge me on this. As I tell my students in my uh, in, uh, in in the Dao Masterclass course, uh, that the my purpose is to my purpose is, is to teach you uh, obviously these things, and your purpose is to refute me. 
uh, as a way to learn and to come to certainty. So you have to refute everything I say. Uh, we don't have enough time to probably do that, of course, in this session, but um, I, uh, I would certainly encourage you to have at it, as, as the Americans say. So, um, yeah. Any, anyone else have any further questions or comments or contentions? We do have another question. Um, this one is, uh, why can't the first cause be the universe instead of God? Why can God be infinite, but not the universe? Okay, so uh, the observable universe, okay? We're just gonna talk about what we can, the observe, what we are observing. We're observing things which are finite and limited. And so why can't they be infinite? Well, because they're finite. Um, and that's, that's the sum of it. Uh, if you're saying that maybe they're secretly infinite, they just appear to be finite. But then that finiteness that you observe be, is a creation of, this in, of these infinite things and so these, the finite things that you're observing are not the things anyway, right? They still wouldn't be, the, the, in essence, the, 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 uh, they wouldn't be the, the, the same as the infinite thing that's projecting them. And seeing as we really discussed that you can't have multiple infinite um, separate gods with separate wills because God has no form, shape, and his will is unlimited. They can only be one because there's only one jurisdiction, right? There's an... There's one will with one jurisdiction uh, and, and with no limits. So by dint of that, there can only be one God. And this one God is infinite and is not finite. And therefore, anything that you observe, which is finite, by definition, isn't that God. Uh, which, is, which is the same conclusion that Ibrahim came to, which is related in the Quran. Uh, Ibrahim, uh, you know, first worshipped the sun, but the sun sunset. Uh, he worshipped the moon, the sort of moon set, because he came from a polytheistic society, and this is before he had a revelation. Um, he he realized that these things which set and change and are subject to motion and change and are limited cannot be the creator, and the creator must be something that is outside of of uh, limited things and outside of change. And you might say, why can't the universe be the first cause? The problem is. That well, what do you mean by the universe, right? So if you're saying the universe is what well, part of this reality that we're in, uh, well, to initiate from nothing means you're unlimited, right? You 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 don't have limitations, and as I said, the, the creator of the universe has to be have no limitations. But to initiate from from uh, from absolute nothing, um, it has to have choice, has to have will, and um, in essence. We, we already kind of concluded the universe, the, the God doesn't have components, it's not divisible, it's not made of substance, the universe is made of substance, it's divisible, and what have you. So any which way you look at it, the universe, because it's finite, just can't be infinite, uh, as in it can't be um, something which are finite or limited things can't be infinite at the same time. And infinite, I don't mean infinite in size, I mean um, it can't be without its existence uh, doesn't have boundaries because the very fact that what, what you can observe, you're observing things and they're things because they have, they have boundaries, right? And fundamental particles or the disruptions in the, in the, in the various uh, fundamental fields of the universe um, are all, all have boundaries. Uh, and hence they are a separate thing because they are defined by their boundaries. But anything that has boundaries just can't be the creator because the creator by definition doesn't have boundaries. And so, hence, it can't be the universe. For the same reason that it can't be a stone statue, it can't be a human, uh, it can't be uh, an elephant, right? Uh, it has to be something that has no limits, in essence. And anything that does have limits is ultimately only a projection, i.e. a creation of, uh, or a projection of the power of that, uh, of, of a thing that has no limits. Um, I hope that, that that makes sense. I can maybe go into a bit more detail if you'd like, or we get, or a different angle, or maybe if you feel I haven't answered it, but uh, well, um, uh, 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 maybe reform it in an, in an angle you'd you'd like me to answer it. So, um, but yeah, so the, the the creator is not divisible; it's not made of a substance. If it was made of a substance, then it would need to be created by something else. Um, one well, another argument and another line of reasoning you could argue not from just change, but from finitude, as I say, an argument from finitude which is that um, if something has limits, 
uh, what defined its limitations. So either it defined its limits or something else defined its limits. If it defined its limits, so it could choose whatever limits it wanted to be exist in, then in essence, it doesn't have limits uh, because it could be anything it wants, right? And therefore, um, what you see, the choice it makes isn't the same as the thing itself. The choice it makes is really the, its own, is the creation of this, of the thing. But the essence of a thing is separate from the thing that has limits. So if a thing has limits and its essence is limited, which is what this thing is, uh, then we know that it didn't define itself. And if it didn't define itself, it has to be defined by something outside itself. So something else gave it those limitations. Because why does not why does bottle not twice as big as what it is, or half as big as what it is, or you know a different color or you know a different shape? Um, if it didn't choose to be that shape, then something else chose it to be, or some other process or force chose it to be that shape. And so ultimately, if you if you take the the, the chain of determinism, right, of, of and determining meaning determinus, meaning to to give it its 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 ends, the ending of it, the the, the shape of it, in essence, that's what the determinism means to determine something. Then there has to be an ultimate determiner that itself wasn't determined. So the first determiner uh, is itself not determined. And if it's not determined, it has no limits. So but everything in this universe that we observe is determined because it has limits. And if something doesn't have limits, then you could never see it, but you also couldn't be what you couldn't be with it in a physical sense, of course, because where is its limits, right? And where would you be next to it, right? Because it's not really not next to something that has no limit boundaries. Right. So, so we would say that uh, the universe can't be the creator because it's limited and the, the observable universe. Then someone might say, well, what, what, what about the, maybe there's, not, there's an unobservable universe that is unlimited. Right? How do you know that's not the case? Well, if you mean by the word universe, universe means everything that exists, everything that exists. So I say, OK, I, I actually agree with you. There is a there is a part of reality that we can't see that is unlimited and calls what we can see into existence. It's called God. And we'd end up in the same conclusion. So I hope that answers your question. Um, I did just want to ask um, before we continue um, if it is okay to keep on going and how many, if so, how many questions do you still want to answer? I recognize it's 2 a.m. Uh, where you are, and so it's very late for you. Um, and so if you just want to let us know how many more, inshallah. Or if you well, are. I, I have uh, availed myself of dangerously high dosages of caffeine, so I should be good to go. Um, uh, for, for, for as many questions as is as, as, as can uh, be elicited from the public. So please continue. Um, okay, I will continue on with the next question. Um, uh, if everything was intended, then were people going to hellfire and their deeds also intended? Would this not be forcefully imposing them with bad deeds and then punishing them in hellfire? Okay. So this is a, this is a good question uh, to ask um, the the question of of um, uh, punishment in hellfire. So, uh, firstly, uh, we have to come demonstrate. You know, how does God affect free will? If everything depends on Him and everything that happens is by His intention, well, uh, if the creator of the universe can select one particular type of universe from an infinite amount of possible selections that He could have done then clearly not only does he have intent, but would obviously have um, what you might call knowledge um, or, uh, or what, what might approximate uh, to what we call knowledge. Um, so, and his knowledge, his knowledge is limited to what happens, but rather is infinite, has no limits to it because he can choose from an infinite potential of, of all kinds of universes to make. And he made this particular one uh, to exacting specifications and not not a different specifications and of course this universe could have been uh, slightly bigger and uh and, and to to an unlimited degree it could have been 10 times big 100 times big a thousand times big a billion times bigger than what it is uh the, the observable universe anyway or, or what have you so uh, we certainly know that uh the the creator has 
unbound potential and has knowledge of unbound potential, what we call, what we would call knowledge uh, of unbound potential using our human language. Um, now, knowing is knowledge not being limited uh, to what happens. Um, the creator knows what you would do if you truly had the initiating ability that he does to initiate your own actions uh, from, from, from nothing, uh, to truly choose. Although for us, we have a limited form of will. Our will is limited to choosing between at least two options. Uh, we, but we need both options to be present in order for our free will to be manifest, whereas the creator has, can initiate from infinite potential options. Uh, and so you could argue that maybe the, the creator of the universe is the only thing that has a true, truly free will, whereas we have a type of free, of free will, but it's rather limited. It's dependent on him facilitating it for us. However, uh, does it mean that our choices are now decided for us and we have no, uh, we are blameless and victims of, uh, of a divine determinism? Well, no, because the creator of the universe, his knowledge not being limited to what happens, knows what you would have done if you could initiate from, from nothing, if you could truly initiate your own decision from yourself. And then he brings it about. He brings about that choice. That's how he facilitates your free will. And, and, and it comes from yourself, but you need his help. Well, you need his help to exist. I mean, without him sustaining you, uh, you'd cease to exist. And so it's not really a, it's a as, as they say in North America, it's, North, it's a no-brainer, right? Um, so that being the case now, uh, now let's get into th that being the, the result of free will. Um, he makes us knowing our choices that we what we would make, but he never made us to see what we would do because he really knows what we would do. Uh, he made he made us uh, for us to like he made everything in the universe for us to exist and to be a manifestation of his power to create, uh, and that's our first and fundamental um, purpose. Uh, and that's what he wanted. He didn't want. He's not doing a science experiment to learn new knowledge. Uh, he's our first and fundamental purpose is to exist as a manifestation of his power to create. But our, why then uh, have free will? Well, free will is something is now a little bit extra than the average um, creature in this universe. Um, free will is that is, is seemingly intended, if you see contemplate it, us having free will is intended for us to basically, despite the lesser causalities of this universe, the lower causalities of this universe, the, the, the base causalities of this universe, the base motivations, as you call it. Despite this, we still choose to, um, to, to uh, recognize the creator as the ultimate cause behind all things. We pick, we, we pick, we align ourselves to the ultimate cause against the lesser causes of this universe. Um, and that is a manifestation of the creator, right? Our, us choosing the creator as the ultimate cause is, in essence, uh, a, a, a subset of the basic purpose behind all things to be a manifestation of the creator. So you choosing to uh, acknowledge the creator as the, as the ultimate cause behind all things, as the ultimate and the only cause, the only real thing that has any meaning, is a manifestation of the creator but via the faculty of free will. But then of course then, if you choose not to recognize the creator as the ultimate creator and, and the only thing that has meaning, i.e. Not, uh, not to bear witness that the creator is the, man, is the, is the only manifest, uh, not, not to be a manifestation of the creator, um, then this is what we call a sin, right? This is all, or even outright rejection or rebellion, uh, kufr, uh, rejection of truth. What do you do in that scenario? Or rather, what does what is um, what has been what recompense or what, what uh, justice or completion or perfection uh, has been instituted for that uh, that ev uh, eventuality for some human beings? Well, there's 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 in essence the you know we call Jahannam or the place of punishment. But you see, here's the thing. Um, because in this life, we see that not all human beings live to the same life, the uh, same you know, age. Some die very young, some die very old. Some have more pain in their life, some have less pain in their life. Some have more comfort, some have less comfort. Uh, 
but if we are all exactly the same experiences of the universe um, within this universe as, as the same species, there has to be a redress, a, a, an eventual balancing out of all this. So for, for those who have um, more pain in this life, um, they would they would have uh, less in the next. I, I, I would say so. Then what we'd call forgiveness of sin. So the more you suffered in this life, uh, the the more of your sins would be um, ex expiated because uh, because of that, basically. But at the same time. For those people who choose to uh, to reject the Creator in this life, um, that would mean that there'd be something in this life that didn't fulfill the purpose of the Creator that the Creator intended for it to fulfill. In a way, this is a proof that there has to be an afterlife because the afterlife being a redress to what we see is the, what we would appear to be uh, in the incomplete journeys or purposes of mankind in, in this life we know is a proof that there has to be an afterlife. And in this afterlife of those who commit sin or who reject, um, uh, not those who commit sin, uh, but repent, uh, because repentance is, again, acknowledging that you f you temporarily fell foul of, of lower causality, but your aim has always been the highest causality. Um, those who are reprobates, those who will always pick the lower causality over the highest causality, over acknowledging the creator as the ultimate cause and, me and meaning behind all things, i.e. being using their free will to bear witness to the creator um, and making their free will itself a, a, a manifest a bearing witness to the creator or, or a manifestation of a uh, of the creator creator's existence um, in the hereafter because those people would always pick the lower causalities over the highest causality they have uh, the hereafter is designed to to perfect them too Right. And their perfection, the perfection of their purpose, is only reached in the place of Jahannam. Right? We know as Jahannam or or, um, or hell, because in hell, it, that's the only place they would ever acknowledge um, the Creator or ever acknowledge they they commit they were wrong for what they were doing. It's the only place they would ever um, admit uh, or bear witness to the Creator and and. And in essence, try to turn to him because they wouldn't do so otherwise. In essence, they're compelled; they are being compelled in the in the hereafter to do that which they wouldn't and they couldn't do voluntarily in in, uh, in this life, having shown their true colours to be those who would willfully um, uh, cease to commit, cease to fulfil their purpose. And of course, like like not like going against your purpose in in this life, you you experience misery and suffering and depression and things like that. Not all, not all depression is is indicative of that. Of course, some depression is due to the various illnesses that humans encounter in this life, uh, which is part of an evidence to show us that we are limited. Um, but uh, in the hereafter, it will be uh, they will be perfected by the fact that they will they will only they will they will acknowledge the Creator in the in the um, in the hereafter um, by going into a place they call they call hell. Um, what was quite fascinating is. Um, I'm going to kind of share my screen again because I want to show you that verse of the Quran that I was I, I, I referenced. Have a read of this. This is all the Quran. Has, look at the Quran's explanation. Um, but if you could but see when they will be held over um, the fire, they will say, "Would that we were sent back uh, to the world, then we would not deny the signs of our Lord, and we would be of the believers. We would be those who um, uh, the the word." Uh, Iman comes from Aman, I mean, to trust. So those who place their trust in following their, the, the natural law that was given to them by the Creator uh, to, to follow, um, but they said they decide, no, I'm going to I'm going to follow the lower causalities of, of this world uh, over the, the Creator. Um, no, it has become manifest to them what they had been concealing before. So uh, their uh, this life demonstrated their true colors and but if they were returned they would certainly revert to that which they were forbidden indeed they are liars also another verse in the quran when they're in um in their when they're in uh, hell they say in essence now we confess our sins we we are now we confess we were wrong um but they will not be allowed out of it so in essence, what is, this is, this is kind of the Quran is really amazingly um, arguing is that 
the, the hell is the only place that ever recognized the creator. And if they were to be taken out of it, they'd go back to picking out the lower causalities um, uh, over the creator. They'd be going out to, in a way, in essence, worshipping other things other than the creator, um, their own desires, society, or their false idols or things like that. Um, but if you just think about it, it's like, you know, looking at human psychology, that all of you guys have, have seen in your own, you know, your own social circles, maybe, presumably. Haven't you know, have you ever seen someone who, they do bad things, they don't care about what they do, um, they don't care who they harm, but when they are going to be punished for what they do, when the punishment is coming or they, they're in, under threat of punishment or judgment, suddenly they say, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I knew, I, I know what I was doing was wrong, I'm sorry, I, you know, I know it was wrong, I shouldn't have done that. But when the punishment is gone or they've been forgiven, they go right back to doing what they did before, unrepentedly, and also justifying it. They justify it. It's not that you make mistakes and you, because as human beings, we're going to make endless, we're going to repeat the same mistakes again and again. But at least we, we don't need to be under, for those of us who are just the, the, uh, the majority branch of man mankind, I think, or um, most Muslims I've observed, like myself, we're just sinners, right? We, we, we make the same mistakes again, but we don't need the threat of punishment to acknowledge it's wrong and we constantly try to fight against against these desires, try to reprogram ourselves for the sake of God. We don't stop doing that. We keep fighting against ourselves. Um, but there are the reprobates, those, the kufar, uh, kufar being defined as the insincere, yeah. not to be confused with the word non-Muslim, right? Uh, kufar is a term in the Quran that, that um, there's, it, there's one particular verse that refers to it, um, that, that refers to those who are insincere. Of course, it can be used in different senses, but in, in the, the theological concept of the kuffar, the eschatological kuffar, on the Day of Judgment, those, they are the insincere, the ones who just, they, they follow their own desires, they follow whatever society tells them, they don't care about the, the ultimate cause behind all things. Um, those people, much like those you know who are reprobates, who would only say they were wrong, only admit they're wrong when they're being punished for it, when it doesn't go out, when it doesn't go well for them. Uh, they would only ever acknowledge God in the, in the um, in, in, in uh, Jahannam, and so and for those who go to, to paradise, those are those who were grateful and acknowledge God in this life. And it's described as gratitude that you acknowledge you, that you've been created by the Creator, you acknowledge what He's given you. This is gratitude. Uh, they will be rewarded, but they would be grateful to God whether they were rewarded or not. So they are rewarded in the same way they are that your your brain rewards you with serotonin and dopamine in in this life as god intended it to be so when you are when you achieve your instinctual drives when you are when you're successful achieving your instinctual extinct instinctual drives you are given that um that that reward mechanism so you'll be rewarded in the hereafter likewise but for those of you uh, and i hope none of you are the, are the case but for those of mankind who are reprobates um who only acknowledge that, that they are wrong who only acknowledge the, the truth when when they are compelled to, they will be eternally compelled to. Um, and so in the hereafter, the hereafter will be the perfection of all creatures that have free will. Uh, you'll be, you'll, you will go to the right place for you to reach the perfection of your purpose. I hope that makes much more sense now. Um, uh, the, the, Quran, the Quran's own explanation, I hope it makes much more sense now uh, to, your, to your question. Um, we have another one. It says, uh, don't quantum mechanics experiments and theories show that randomness exists? What about particles popping in and out of existence? Example, gluons. Okay. So um, the idea of randomness, things coming out of existence from nothing, um, science, there's no scientific experiment that could ever demonstrate that or, or, or show that. Um, I'll, I'll discuss virtual particles in a second, but basically there is no, um, when, when a particle appears to come into the range of the sensors, the fact is the scientists don't know where they come from. Right? So virtual particles, particles that basically you have a, a type of, um, you know, uh, one particle and it's anti and it's anti version and they annihilate and they do it. So they, they come into existence or rather they come into the range of, of our detectors 
and then they pop out of the range of our detectors. They, they, they hit each other and they pop out of the range of our detectors. That's what's happening. That's actually what's happening in the experiments. When people say, ah, they've come out of existence from nothing and they pop back into nothing, that's the speculation. That's the assumption being made. Now, imagine, I use the example, uh, you're flying a plane and the, 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 the forward facing radar of the plane, obviously is facing, it has a certain cone that faces forward. Now, as the plane is flying, um, there might be a bird that comes up. So the, the plane is flying, a bird comes up, a big one, let's just say, and it pops into the, the, uh, onto the radar screen of the pilot. The pilot doesn't say, oh, birds just come out of nothing. Well, the, there's an expression there's a, there's a, there's a, in, in English language, oh, that bird just came out of nowhere, right? But we don't literally mean nowhere. That will be completely absurd for something to come out literally of um, nowhere by nothing, right? By nothing. Um, so the same with virtual particles and um, gluons. Um, if you're going to be absolutely factual about what the experiments show, the experiments only show that these things pop into the range of our ability to detect them and then they pop out of the range of our ability to detect them with our current equipment. That's the factual description of what the experiments have shown. Anything on top of that is now people just speculating and going on flights of fantasy. Um, however, however, uh, if you want to motivate the atheist or skeptic, if you want to motivate them to find out where virtual particles and gluons actually come from and where they go, uh, where they appear to go, uh, which is it another dimension? Is it some is it some substratum of reality that we don't observe uh, that interacts with our visible substratum of reality, visible um, stratum of reality, uh, uh, and they just pop up from from there, or is it type of is it like a quantum uh, vacuum fluctuations? are just fluctuations of some kind of um, uh, kind of universal uh, field that unites all the way, all the different um, uh, fields in the field theory uh, that is just below the first surface of our, of our, of our um, dimension. And uh, as the, the peaks and the troughs, as they, as they hit our reality, uh, we see it as particles, as virtual particles. That's just, you know, the, you know in the ocean when uh, you see the, the foam and the spray, spray you know, come out due to the, the interaction of the waves, uh, that those that spray maybe that's the virtual particles or maybe that's the uh, you know the quantum field fluctuations uh, quantum vacuum fluctuations um you know Allah alam on this you know i, I want to do some more science i want i don't want to speak from ignorance some atheists or skeptics they want to posit atheism of the gaps you know or you know skepticism of the gaps uh, or not skepticism of the gaps because it's not really i wish they were skeptical of their own speculations they're not uh they are totally fine to accept their speculations as, as being possible um so rather it's atheism of the gaps in that sense. They say, oh, well, this proves that things come out of nothing well, uh, and by nothing. Well, it doesn't. You don't observe that. You're now speaking outside of observation now. Um, but I want to motivate you, you know, to tell them. I want to motivate you to find out. Because right now, you, you don't seem motivated to find out where virtual particles come from, where gluons come from. I'm going to help motivate you. Okay? I don't believe this, but I'm going to motivate you. Uh, well, well, I don't know for sure, so but I'm going to motivate. So my motivation is this: uh, that's proof that God is creating particles and bringing and bring them in and out of existence all the time. It's God doing that. God is, is bringing the virtual particles in into existence and taking them out of existence. You know, God giveth and God taketh away. Um, there you go. Then you'll see the atheists say, "Oh, that's that's God of the gaps argument." You're making speculations. You are assuming things. I'm gonna. Science will one day find out where virtual particles come from and uh, where they come from and what produces them, and it will be deterministic. And I'll be great because that was the only thing I could ever tell you to make you feel like that. Because prior to that, me saying it to you as God, you were happy to posit it was atheism, or, or like it was randomness, the, the god of atheism, as it, you know. Uh, <laughs> that's the, that's their god. So. Um, that would be my point. I, I don't believe, I don't know where virtual particles come from. I don't know where glue ones come from. Um, or, or, or all the types of part or all the types of, um, of, of observable, um, uh, phenomena that, that just appears in our senses and disappears from our senses. Uh, I don't know. I'm not saying what causes them. 
uh, yes, it could be God creating, uh, causing them, um, and that would make rational sense if it was. The, 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 the disadvantage is the atheist's uh, argument for randomness doesn't make sense because it's arguing from nothing and by nothing something counts. So do you see how science can never, ever um, answer the question? Because even if you, if you were to find where um, uh, virtual particles come from and it, they came from maybe a, a substratum dimension underneath ours, let's just say, and they return back to it in some way, um, uh, one uh, or, the, or two disruptions of a, sub, of a substratum field, which is what quantum field theory posits that, uh, you know, what you call particles are just, in a way, disruptions in fields. In essence, um, uh, whatever is the case, uh, you know, science can't can never really prove that what is beneath the most fundamentalist part of of reality. Um, you can find the most you know indivisible part of reality, which they now speculate is um, Planck. Obviously, well, due to the equation, the equations, the equation that the models of which the or physics that that operate now, uh, which use obviously the Planck constant. Um, when you rejig them around, they suggest that the smallest unit that the models of physics can speak about is Planck space and Planck time, the smallest unit of space and the smallest unit of, of time for representing change. Um, uh, is that the smallest thing? Well, we don't know for certain. Are the, is that the smallest unit of time? We don't know for certain. Uh, but we know there has to be some fundamental unit of something because otherwise you'd fall into Zeno's paradoxes of an infinite amount of points between any distance will mean that you can't have movement, right? So there has to be um, uh, discrete, reality must be discrete, not continuous on a fundamental level, uh, which was predicted by Zeno and you could m maybe Planck's uh, constant demonstrated through his, by his equations, uh, by equations that were taken by others, um, that reality has a Reality has pixels, right? <laughs> Smallest units that that is not divisible beyond that. Um, and of course, the uh, the atomists of the ancient Greek, the uh, they believed that the, the, there were things of reality that couldn't be divided, called atoms, atomos, meaning indivisible, um, to get around Zeno's paradoxes. But my, my my point is that rationality is the only thing that can be used to discuss any of these matters, um, whereas atheism. Uh, if indeed we are facing the boundaries of the universe with virtual particles and they are coming from outside the universe, breaking the first conservation law of energy that, oh, oh you know, uh, well, it doesn't really break the law because that would just mean that the universe is not an isolated system and that, and that energy introduced into it from outside and taken out from it again. Um, then all it would suggest is that uh, the creator isn't just sustaining uh, the building blocks that he first created, but uh, but not adding any new building blocks to what he's currently sustaining, uh, but he's actually adding new building blocks and taking them out con uh, constantly. That's all it would all it would prove. Um, but we don't say that virtual particles are are are, are being um, are brand new building blocks being introduced by the creator because we don't know for certain. Uh, but the atheists can't, can't the, my point is the atheists can't argue uh, otherwise. They can't argue that they come from nothing, by nothing. Um, and if there were, if it was a fight between the two explanations, the atheists arguing it was randomness, i.e. from nothing, by nothing, and the Muslim arguing or the theists arguing it was from nothing by the creator, that one would make, would make rational more, rationally more sense than this one because randomness is absurd and self-contradictory and falls foul of the law of non-contradiction. So I hope that answers your question um, in, uh, in regards to, to, to that. So I, I wish, I wish um, atheists stop uh, reading some popular science books and speculating. Some atheists are actual physicists and they introduce their speculation in, uh, and they, as a type of pseudoscience, um, like, like Vilenkin of which uh, uh, Valenkin um, introduced a, 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 a speculation subtly disguised as a, as a type of as a theory uh, of the origin of the universe and it was kind of later taken on by an atheist who popularized it a bit more called Lawrence Krauss. It was the argument that the universe, um, he he, they, they said we can show using physics that the universe can come from nothing and you go oh no is that is that is that really the case can, can you uh, and Valenkin just says well yeah because 
uh, uh, you know, you take a probability of something happening from nothing, uh, so it, which is not zero, and then when it happens, uh, then if it happens, if the right kind of thing happens from nothing, then it can cause uh, a, a, an expansion. You have the um, you know gravity at, at, at a small scale has a, has a, an inverse effect or a reverse effect. It actually ex um, has a repulsive effect. It causes expansion, and then we can explain the universe and get to this point in the universe using the the uh, the laws of physics that we know. I was like, oh wait, wait, wait a second there, Valenki. So you said something at the very beginning of your um, so-called uh, treatise on on physical treatise. You said something comes from nothing and we give it a probability and then once you had something coming from nothing you explained a physical process behind which that something evolves into the universe um that that some when you start having a something evolving into the universe uh, that's fine i can accept that but it was before that something that you just very slyly introduced an assumption or you just asserted something that something comes from nothing N now let's on now let's go on to physics and talk about how once we have this something how it can change into and become expand into a universe no wait, wait, wait a second just there that's just all you did you just introduced something coming from nothing by sleight of hand and then you use physics to talk about when you have that something how that something can become uh, can expand in size okay it's like someone um, someone saying to me, um, let, let's give you, I'm going to give you an analogy for those who, who, have, who have lost in, the, in, in this uh, discussion. So um, uh, let's say, you know, someone, uh, you know, you're, someone's cooking, a, baking a cake, okay? And you're, there's, there's, the, there's the atheist baker and there's the, the theist baker. So the atheist baker says, um, I, I can prove that cakes come from nothing. They, I can prove they come from nothing. And the theist baker's like, what? That's ridiculous. How can you prove it? Say, well, we know that, you know, when you put yeast into, uh, obviously, dough, dough expand and, you know, uh, and so on. So this particular uh, cake, um, so the, the, it starts out as a very small thing. So it comes out into existence as a very small little uh, piece of dough. And then when you apply the heat, we can, we can know from the models of, of uh, obviously, chemistry that, you know, yeast expands under heat and, and it expands into the, the cake we see today. And, and therefore, I've shown from the, the principles of, of chemistry how cakes can come from nothing. And, of course, the Vias Baker's like, no, you didn't really do that because you just said the initial piece of dough pops into existence from nothing and then because it has a bit of yeast in it and it has a mixture of obviously flour and so on and so forth, uh, it undergoes chemical reactions from that small piece of dough expanding into the, the cake or what have you, the biscuit uh, or the, the cookie as you guys, as you guys call it um, uh, later on. Uh, you, you assert something at the beginning that is absurd and then you apply the laws of physics to it after you, it was absurdly introduced. That's not... Uh, a, a, a physics, a, a theory, a, a scientific theory, or even a scientific hypothesis. Uh, that's just assertions uh, and, a, and, a, and an absurd one as well. So I hope that makes more sense to you guys. And now don't be fooled by so-called pseudo-scientific uh, arguments for that to reject the existence of a creator. Unfortunately, because many physicists today, historically not the case, when most physicists used to be theists, of course, and many are today, are, are, are theists, very productive ones who've actually won um, many prizes and, and, and made many, many valuable contributions, um, including the one like Georges Lemaitre, the uh, Belgian priest, who, disagree, who Einstein disagreed with him because Einstein wanted to, wanted to uh, believe the universe was eternal and unchanging. This was before the Big Bang. And Georges Lemaitre showed a model of the universe that was expanded from a small point because in the universe has, hasn't always existed, at least in the way that it that you see it. It, it came from a small point and expanded, and it, and uh, Einstein didn't like that. Einstein and his, and his maybe atheist bias, perhaps, didn't want to acknowledge that because that means the universe, in essence, you know, is that looks quite likely. It meets the predictions of the theist who would argue that the universe was created, uh, coming from a uh, coming from a common point and expanding into existence. It does look like something that is the product of creation, right? It matches the prediction of the uh, of the, hy the the hypothesis of the theism, right? 
So George Lamont is a Belgian priest and a physicist, right? And his uh, obviously model of initial expansion um, now is the is is now the you know the the, mo the mainstream model of understanding of the universe, um, its evolution over time, uh, expansion from a small point. Uh, and Einstein famously said to him, uh, you know, I I can't deny your maths, but I hate your conclusion. <laughs> right? Uh, the mass, the model worked, but there wasn't there wasn't proof for it. But, but the model explained what you could observe, uh, but it, it wasn't proven until obviously the Hubble telescope and redshift was detected. But the idea that the Big Bang, the term the Big Bang, was actually a pejorative word given or a phrase given to that model, uh, because those who who were prior to that, um, uh, the, the those who, the, the the mainstream idea was that the universe was just had, had, was unchanging forever. It was unchanging uh, forever. And the atheists liked that. It's, ah, no need for God. We have scientific, the mainstream scientific theory is that the universe is eternal and it's unchanging. That, will, that was said back 100 years ago right? and then, then got refuted. You know? So I'm sick and tired of this atheism, constant atheism of the gaps arguments because they, they just get refuted all the time uh, as, as the boundaries of our knowledge get pushed more and more, we push our atheism more and more out. <laughs> right, anyway, I hope that makes um, some sense. Um, science should stay out of the, this discussion because it, it, it can only measure what's inside our bubble, how the bubble changed over time. That's all it can do. But where the bubble ultimately comes from, um, or the bubble of bubbles, where it ultimately comes from, uh, only rationality can tell you that. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Um, next question is, why would God create us? He would not gain anything from us. So what is God trying to achieve when God can be content by himself? Okay, so... Um, what the, one of the biggest problems uh, which causes... Uh, skepticism against theism is anthropomorphism. Uh, it's, it's like uh, humans constantly do this. Uh, uh, not to berate anybody, I mean, I, I'm, I had to work many years on discovering subtle and hidden anthropomorphistic assumptions I made about the creator myself until I realized that these were silly, silly assumptions. I don't know where they, where they even come from. It was me assuming that the creator operates under the same rules or under the same. Um, Basis of this as me, a limited created being. Um, so, in essence, um, uh, you know, many atheists are are actually just rejecting an anthropomorph an anthropomorphic creator, right? Um, and it's not the creator that we believe in. Uh, so, as Muslims, la ilaha illallah. There is no nothing worthy of worship. But there's no there's no gods. There's no gods except the creator. Um, and there's and there's nothing as the as the Surah Ikhlas says, the one I quoted, there's nothing like unto him. Okay. So, um, in that sense, when you imagine that the Creator makes the universe, you are imagining that he does it for the same reason that you do things, which is uh, you are trying to attain, uh, achieve a satisfaction. You have a drive or, a net or an instinct that you need to satisfy. And so you do something. You're, pro you're propelled to do it. But the creator um, doesn't have instincts or uh, a nature that makes him do things. Right? So he, he the, oh, and just in case anyone um, raises some issue or confusion about this, when we refer to the creator as he, it's not because the creator is a man. The creator, the creator gender is a is a is basically part of sex. It's related to creatures that reproduce, which are limited, finite ones. The creator doesn't. He doesn't beget. Right, so he's not a man. He's not a male. He's not a female. He is above that. But using the word "it" kind of is, is a bit irreverent and implies that the creator is um, almost like a stone or something, or like it's, it has no mind. And so, in the Arabic, the word is used in the Quran. It's used the word "he" as a as a kind of um, a default to means just something that has uh, uh, has a will. Irada in Arabic, right? so that's all it means. So uh, don't pay that any mind, although there are people that do pay that a bit too much mind. Certainly those who have been uh, somewhat infected by uh, left-wing politics, 
Um, but I also, just in case anyone thinks, because so, you didn't hear my earlier discussion earlier today, um, uh, I'm, I, I'm uh, condemning of left-wing and right-wing um, politics because these are measurements of schools of thought within the Western Enlightenment system and has nothing to do with Islam. Islam is outside the Western Enlightenment, more enlightened than the Western Enlightenment, and therefore there is no left-wing or right-wing. There's no conservative or liberal Muslim. It's because uh, as Muslims, we, we change things that need to be changed, and so we're not conservative. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we uh, are, are, are not uh, letting people do uh, whatever whatever they want, irregardless of the, uh, sorry, uh, uh, regardless of or irrespective of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the consequences, of course. So it's, it's not um, you know, liberal either. Uh, or, or try to change, or just constantly about change. Uh, so it's about just doing what's right, in essence, and, and establishing uh, the natural law and um, tr seeking perfection in that we become um, more and more at, at achieving our purpose in as much as we can as, as finite creatures, developing our knowledge, increasing our, our, our knowledge, improving ourselves, uh, deleting bad habits, uh, reprogramming ourselves to have good habits. Uh, that's not... That's not conservative, and obviously that's not liberal either. Anyway, um, going back on the um, onto the discussion, so the creator is not looking for something to benefit himself uh, at all, uh, but rather the creator creates uh, creates creation as a manifestation of his power to 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 create, and, and that's it. Um, it. The purpose behind it is its own end, in that sense, because because he by dint of his will being the first cause, there cannot be something else behind his first, his, his first, his will to make it him want something, to, to, to get something out of it. Um, so uh, he does not gain anything from it. But if you, if, uh, maybe from a, another angle, if you'd like to consider it, um, uh, God doesn't, is not benefited by, by creating um, the universe or uh, crazy or limited things. But reality gains from creation, right? Uh, because if there's no creation and then there is creation, then there's been a gain, a net gain, right? So in a way, uh, the creator doesn't, doesn't get anything from it. Doesn't, it doesn't give him satisfaction. He doesn't have um, a, even desire for satisfaction uh, because satisfaction is what is used. It's like a, a psychological, you know, carrot and stick that makes you want to uh, seek something out, right? But the creator doesn't have, doesn't have that. So he's not, there's nothing to be gained, uh, nothing that he gains uh, or, uh, get, uh, or rather than just gain itself, as in there was nothing, there was no additional reality. Now there's an, an addition to reality. There is the existence of finite limited things, whereas beforehand there wasn't finite and limited things, or at least this universe anyway. So uh, that would be the way I would answer it. And the Quran says as much. The Quran says that if he if it was if he was trying to seek something, trying to seek satisfaction, he sat, he's he is self sufficient and hence satisfied, um, so to speak, with what is within himself, so to, so to speak, as in he's just self um, self sufficient, as the, as the Arabic you know is the the the, the, the term used in the Arabic. Um, however, him creating. Um, adds to reality, and so he doesn't gain anything, but there there is gain happening in reality by creating, and that would be the way I would answer it. Jazakumullah khairan. Um, so we are actually going to be wrapping up now, inshallah. Um, I just wanted to say that we truly appreciate your time, Abdullah and Lucy. Um, you've given us so much time. It's extremely late where you are and your answers and your lecture, mashallah, were extremely detailed and thorough. Um, and for everyone else, we do have a Reddit um, AMA uh, tomorrow with Abdullah and Andalusi, um, where you can ask as many questions as you want again, like today. Um, and we encourage people to ask um, your questions there um, during the live booth at 11 a.m. inshallah. Um, and then after our virtual boots, we will be continuing with our lecture at 4 p.m. again. Um, and so with that, I just wanted to say Jazakumullah Khairan, um, Abdullah Andalusi, and for everyone um, attending, uh, for being engaging, 
um, and joining up today. And we look forward to seeing everybody at um, the rest of our week um, for our events um, and seeing you all tomorrow, inshallah. Have a good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'll see you guys all tomorrow. You can continue to berate me with your contentions uh, in the, uh, the, is it the afternoon session, I believe. Inshallah, I think it is in, in your time. Uh, yes, I believe it's at, um, it's 11 a.m. in BC, but it can, it will be in the more afternoon for Saskatchewan and Memorial, so. So, um, yeah, so, so berate away, I, I welcome it. So I'll see you guys all tomorrow, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.